Great. Good evening um, and welcome to the fifth in the series of Poetry at the Lexicon readings. My name is Rosamond Taylor. Welcome to Nidhi Zak, Aria Ipe, Jen Hadfield and Mark Roper. And thank you for coming. Thank you also to Marion Keyes at the Lexicon, who's been so helpful and encouraging in facilitating this reading. And I'm really happy that so many people have been enjoying this series. So this time, I'm really excited to have these three poets with us. We're going to hear from three poets who examine the way we use language itself and how that impacts our understanding of our place in the world. It's never been more important to look outside ourselves and to gain a deeper understanding and respect for the natural world. With care and tenderness, these poets look at landscape, nature and the human form and how we are interconnected. Their work is exciting, inventive, and full of life. I'm so thrilled they'll be sharing their poetry with us today. So before each poet reads, I'll introduce them to you briefly, and then they will read for around 15 minutes, and afterwards we'll discuss their work together. So first we're going to hear from Nidhi Zak, Arya Ipe. Nidhi is a poet, pacifist, and fabulist. Born in India, she grew up across the Middle East, Europe, and North America before calling Ireland home. Founder of the Play It Forward Fellowships, she is poetry editor at Skeen Press and Fallow Media and contributing editor with The Stinging Fly. She is a recipient of the Next Generation Artist Award in Literature from the Arts Council of Ireland and the inaugural Ireland Chair of Poetry Student Award. Her debut poetry collection, Auguries of a Minor God, is forthcoming from Faber and Faber in July 2021. Visionary and imaginative, Nidhi is a vital new voice in poetry. Drawing on her experiences as a migrant, she sees the modern world with fresh eyes. Her forthcoming collection looks at the journey of a family of refugees from the Middle East, as well as exploring love and the body through the five facets of Kama, the Hindu god of love, desire and memory. Nidhi's language is always fresh and exciting. The natural world is a place of lush possibility, full of the numinous, as in Wonder Song, where visiting the woods allows the narrator a glimpse of a goddess rising from the stream, sun-kissed by darting silver trout. Yet she also interrogates similes and the ways in which comparisons fall short. We impose ourselves on the world around us, in because, Nidhi says, an approximation will always break down when you need it most. We cannot stop looking for the ways in which nature reflects our own vulnerability, as Nidhi sees herself reflected in a horse. I am touching this horse, feeling it's like nothing else before us, two silken manes, two hurt mouths. Nidhi's work is full of energy and emotion, and her attentive and inventive use of language is always memorable. She's the kind of poet I feel lucky to read, and I'm delighted she's with us today. So welcome, Nidhi. Thank you so much, Jasmine. It's a lovely introduction. Thank you so much for having us as well. It's really lovely to be here, and particularly with, with the lexicon, which is one of my favourite libraries. So it's really a pleasure to be here and with, with Mark and Jen. So we'll just read you a few um, short poems some from my collection and then some other standard own ones um, which speak to the, to the theme of, of today's conversation. This first one is called The Conjuring. Our horse, or more, rose from the water, still and grey as a lake. How could they know the truth? an ambush of snow. How the crane called to its kin, faint, or eager moving through a home, stranger, a shadow, falling low across the line. How a mare stood sentinel by the door, wise, eyes wide unblinking, Falling 
sprawling, twin kings, a flagstone floor. How we bore your temper wild, spur upon our backs, a man hounded, as our mother yet outruns us, how she stuns us with her pain, mooned, belly heaving life, sharp her cries, cursing their men, days five, lineal nine, across the line. How the birds shift beneath lust's gaze, how they turned on you, swift as a whipping, boy caught in a bind of rage. How they trembled, the fury-filled sprites, as you suffered the life you were denied, then married to the envy of a bride. How they'll swear you loved, but one of us, singular, true, walking, bridled, only one, brother, standing before you. This is a poem called After the Fallout. Um, and it's written after the um, Chernobyl nuclear reactor explosion. After the fallout, you've gone from here, the loud ones, left it all behind, trellis, trolley buses, grand concert piano, drain dry lazuna pool. Abandoned, unmoved, proud pommel horses, fat lip dodgem cars, frozen ferris wheel. They come sometimes, the curious ones, clutching Geiger counters, point and shooting Duga, rusty Russian woodpecker, all ghosts of Pripya. Simon soft paw scampers, eager to join the party, rubs his itchy fur skin on denim decked legs. They laugh seeing him, the carefree ones. Sing song, hey there, buddy, little fella, crisp snap fingers, high pitched whistles, scraps of salt strip jawbreak jerky. Pet his soft, sweet-smelling snout. They say chew on that, the reckless ones. But they've never known hunger, never stalked prey, lain in leopard skin patches, wild, seizing blue grass, scratching head surprised, so much beauty, trees. Dragon Dana Green, so much life inside it all. This is a poem called Self Portrait with Shyness. Maybe I am a maned wolf, lanky, tremulous legs, as if I stepped in something, lean. Deep and dark it makes me look as though I can dance or keep it all close to my torso. This is why I skitter when alarmed. Maybe I am a maned wolf on the inside, so say you were to slit a slight incision by my breast, place an alien object. In my chest, it would show up as light and pulse for you, my heart. Watch it still thrill now when it senses you near. For the rhythm that it makes is yours. How it swells in my belly, how I sing.
I'm just going to finish with um, a final poem called North. And it's written after the nymph Callisto, who was turned into a constellation. North, after Callisto. Isn't it odd now? What are the odds that I would be reading an article which took apart the notion that the English language grows more authentic as we journey closer to the Arctic? And my brother texts with news that the whole thing is a flame, heat ringing circle of wild fires tearing across the landscape, spreading like nobody's business. No one is singularly responsible yet. Every one of us is, so what business do we have coming here? What will we do with this burning? Desire came in the form of a nymph, attendant to Artemis. Love of the hunt bore him a child who became a bear, swinging wide sky beside her son. Stars, both great and small, blazing nightly on their polar progeny set sail on frozen sheets, so white and delicate, how they place their paws, gingerly fillet fish through teeth and bellies straight up to the sun. Know this much, we will never touch such majesty. We will never lose this light. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nidhi. That was so beautiful. It was gorgeous to hear you read. So, yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Um, next, we're going to hear from Mark Roper. Mark Roper's latest poetry collection, Bindweed, Daedalus Press, 2017, was shortlisted for the Irish Times Poetry Now Award. A Gather of Shadow, 2012, was also shortlisted for that award and won the Michael Hartnett Award in 2014. Mark was awarded Arts Council bursaries in 2010, 2013 and 2016. With photographer Paddy Dwan, he has published The River Book, The Back Strand and Comera. The pair are working on a fourth book about the County Waterford coastline. He has also written two librettos for operas composed by Eric Sweeney. Mark is a poet of great scope and depth. He richly immerses the reader in nature, whether a mountain landscape in Namibia or a lane running through an Irish field. Mark looks at our sense of self and our limiting perceptions of the world around us, such as in the poem Things, where the poet picks up a stone and tries to take from it what couldn't be taken. His poems search for the roots of the world, excavating experiences of nature so ancient that they go beyond the scope of language. Beyond imagery, Mark says. Sometimes a thing is what it is, not an excuse for another thing. Like the imagist poet Rainer Maria Rilke, Mark allows his reader to journey beyond what they can touch and describe and to look at the interconnected web in which we all live. He examines the many facets of the natural world with great care and precision and asks his reader to do the same. Mark is someone whose work I return to again and again, and I'm so glad he's with us today. So welcome, Mark. Thanks very much indeed, Rosamond. Thanks, thanks for that lovely introduction, lovely generous introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to be doing this reading and to be reading with, with Nidhi, whose reading I enjoyed so much, and, and with Jen, whose reading I'm sure I'm going to enjoy so much. Um, I'll start with a poem called Long Tail Tits. Um, these are, as you probably know, um, tiny, tiny little birds which have, as you'd expect, very long tails. Um, they're birds that you encounter in, in groups, um, in a wood perhaps, in the garden. They'll suddenly be there beside you, they'll be talking, they'll be moving constantly, and then, then they'll be gone. 
So it's it's like a, a visitation. Uh, there's a small bit in this poem spoken, as it were, by the birds, but I, I think it's clear enough when that happens. So long-tailed tits. A soft settling, sift of whisper, chink and chitter, and you're in the middle of urgent conversation, six or seven or eight or nine or ten of them talking all at once. Listen to me. No, you listen to me. No, you listen. No, you. A carry-on hidden in trees, a speaking of leaves. Is it a house of sound? A second skin? A desperate, I'm here, but where are you? Birds vague in colour, light as dust. So small they'd soon get lost in silence, slip through cracks in the day. It's all around you now, tiny travelling circus. You're hanging on every word, afraid you'll miss something. Then it's gone and you're hurrying after. You're calling, wait, I didn't catch that. What did you say? Sorry, don't mean to be rude. It was just that... And um, this poem is called, uh, if I can open it, um, Coming Down the Mountain. Coming Down the Mountain. You have been where you have been someone else. A place of peat, pool and sky, stripped by wind and swept by light. You've walked yourself invisible, rock your bone and motion, and you would like to walk forever, but you have to go down. You try to take something with you, a sliver of quartz or a ram's horn, a special feather, a piece of eyebright. They soon fade, as a pebble picked from a lake will fade. What's found up there lives only up there, in that high air. All you can take is the way each time you're simplified. The gift of long hours spent alone with stream and stone, where a raven's call took all your attention, where news of the world didn't rate a mention. That poem came from um, long hours walking in the, the Comra Mountains in um, County Waterford. Um, and a few years back, I, I was walking in those mountains and um, I slipped and fell and uh, actually broke my neck and, and had to be rescued. So this is a poem uh, about that experience called After the Fall. Uh, it's similar to the title of Needy's poem, After the Fallout. Um, it's After the Fall. After the Fall, what came from my mouth was not word, but ball. As I think now of pain, of course, but also triumph. Still here, still here. I made arrangements. I knew I'd be saved. All I could do then was look and listen. A wren threading heather. A pipit's measured bounds. The stream carried on sliding over sills, speeding as it dropped, calming down in pools. The constant chatter and good cheer, the voice it gives to rocks enormous reserve. No blame for the place, no blame for myself. I lay there open as a daisy, almost resenting the helicopter, the rescue it brought the helping hands come to lift me from this strange, broken grace. Um, Geraldus Cambrensis was a 
11th century Welsh courtier who visited Ireland and he wrote a, a history of Ireland. And uh, a lot of the history was concerned with uh, the flora and fauna. Uh, very often he, he was kind of using his descriptions to, to point a, a Christian moral. And he talks about a kingfisher and um, in a it kind of in, it's a detail which in, intrigued me that if you want to look after your, your bed linen, the best way is to use a, a dead kingfisher. Um, so this is a poem called Sleeping with the Kingfisher. Sleeping with the Kingfisher. Its appearance in the bed wasn't surprising. Giraudus said a dead one kept linen fresh. No, what surprised was the size of the thing and the way it hugged me close to its breast. To feel its bill run the rule down my spine, to be enfolded in sapphire wings, surprising. How much more so to wake and find myself ablaze my heart, the blue seed, in a blossom of flame. Um, a couple of years ago, I, I was lucky enough to uh, go with my partner to San Ignacio Lagoon in Baja, California, which is a, a long, um, long tidal lagoon. Um, and it's a place where, for probably thousands of years, grey whales have come to breed. Um, it's a remote spot, but, but uh, there are camps there, and you can go and be taken out in wooden boats called pangas um, to be with these whales, which are huge creatures. They're you know, maybe 50 foot long, maybe 50 ton in weight. But... Um, they genuinely don't seem to mind you being there. In, in fact, they appear to, to welcome um, the attention. So th this is a poem, you know, I, I suppose just trying to sort of puzzle out um, what there might be between us. San Ignacio Lagoon. We can't, it seems, leave each other alone. Over an hour, she brings her great body to bear around the small boat. Quick as a lizard, dives, disappears, resurfaces right beside us. In her own way, playing like a kitten. Likeness, our reflex, not like anything. Each barnacle, the sea lice, patches of silver, an odd, familiar, vestigial bristle. On her back, at a right angle to the panga, she displays her pregnant belly. To the sun, to the sky, to us, she declares with pride, Behold, I am with child. No doubt about it. Who knows? Like a huge and heavy dove. Like again. Still, just under the water, her eye, a wise and wrinkled fold, appears to study us in our element as our eyes look down into hers, steady on, and yet a sense that she's smiling, the tip of her mouth in the air as if in a smile open. Who can say? A smile shared between us, that's how we feel. We feel the length and depth of our loneliness. She lets me touch her belly, the softness of her skin, a softness unlike anything. I'm 67 years old. I haven't died too young. It took four days to reach this place and I will never leave. Salt water runs through my fingers. I understand ever less. I'm 67 years old. 
stars run through my hair. And uh, this is called Where, Where Does It Hurt? Where does it hurt? River hidden in the wood, do you mean us harm or good? Cicada, without your song, days are colder, nights long. Why, aspen leaf, do you tremble when there's no wind at all? Your flight, swallow, cannot mend this torn world it seems to mend. O oh, mother, put on the kettle, I am certain of so little. Bell, you strike the hour of eight, we all know it's getting late. Open, beetle, your lovely back, try to show us what we lack. Loving scarf of atmosphere, we pluck your threads, we interfere. Grass, prepare your sharpest blade. They say it's time our debts were paid. Third planet from the sun, what have we done? What have we done? And I'll just finish um, with a, a love poem. This is called The, the Hen Ark. Um, the hen Ark is a kind of mobile mobile hen run that you can move around each day. And we've had one ever since we've lived here for about 40 years now. And um, we've just got one hen at the moment, but she's um, 15 years old and is, is still going strong. So this is addressed a to my partner. And um, the albumin, of course, is the, is the white of an egg, the hen arc. The horse broke your heart, one day knocked you unconscious, made your life unbearable. You'd had enough of animal husbandry, but in the uncovenanted grace of this Indian summer, sun gilds hexagons of wire on a homemade hen arc. You busy with scraps, armfuls of feathery straw, divining differences between our six pullets. Through cluck and chur, one comb rattles and swells. Tonight you bring the first egg, its shell naive and flawless as your smile. Later we crack it on a cup, two gold yolks in a wedding gown of albumin. Thank you. <laughs> oh, that was fantastic, Mark. Thank you so much. I really loved hearing you. Um, yes, thanks, Mark. Um, so next we're going to hear from Jen Hadfield. Jen Hadfield's fourth poetry collection, The Stone Age, explores neurodiversity and was published by Picador in March 2021. She's also working on Storm Pegs, a collection of essays about Shetland, where she lives. Passionately involved with the wild world, she uses poetry, lyrical essay, and occasionally sculpture in cast, in cast porcelain to try and share her intense experience of the here and now. Her work has garnered numerous awards, including the 2008 T.S. Eliot Prize for her second collection, Nigh No Place. She is a creative writing teaching fellow at Glasgow University and is building a house in Shetland very slowly. Jen's language is absorbing and unique. She captures the essence of her subjects, whether they are limpets, cliffs, stone circles, mushrooms, shadows, or even words themselves. She uses words of the Shetland Islands to capture the sounds of the place and the voices of those who live there. Jen's poems show us how the words we use create who we are and how we perceive the world around us. She gives space and texture to the inanimate aspects of the landscape. In her work, our minds overlap with the world, 
the sense of ourselves isn't always defined by the physical edges of our bodies. Jen looks at nature with a direct, unsparing gaze, but also with wit and humour, as in her poem Hearst, where she describes ringing unanswered on the cliff like an old black bakelite phone, a raven. She uses concrete poetry and typographical changes to allow her subjects to break their way onto the, pip, onto the page and create new shapes, as in You Said What You Said from her collection, The Stone Age. Fog pouring over the whale-backed hill, fog and flowers a thousand years, the rustle of the fog, the soft roar of the pouring fog. And you can't see that, but when you look at that on the page, it looks like you're looking at fog. Um, so Jen's work always inspires and moves me. And I'm really, I'm so glad you could join us today from the Shetlands. Um, and I think you're in for a real treat. So welcome, Jen. Skunk cabbage. I have no idea where I comes to an end. Perhaps in walls I frantically throw up, hands flattering like birds between the stones, or in skin touchy as an electric fence. And when you cross this moat of oily water to plant your foot on the welcome map of my liver, I burp out the naked truth like a novelty doorbell or something spouting from a vegetal gland, a rattlesnake pistol. Waxy white, sheathed in a fountain of indigenous leaves. So, thanks so much for the introduction, Rosamond. And it's, it's lovely to spend this um, kind of creative time with all of you. I've really enjoyed the poems so far. Um, I just wanted to jump in with that one because I felt like it touched on some of the things that you were saying in your introduction. Um, and sometimes poems are better at saying things than we are, if that makes any sense. Um, I use poetry quite a lot to say things that would be hard to say in everyday speech. Um, it's been a really beautiful theme weaving through all these readings of where we meet the natural world and where we blend with it and how we get tangled up. Um, so that's what this next poem, Nudebrank, is about. Um, Nudibranchs are sea slugs, um, but the title here is a bit of a cheap pun as well. This is a, a poem about skinny dipping in a rock pool in Shetland um, and meeting the sea slug. It's a, it's a sea hare, actually, um, that we meet in this particular rock pool. They're lovely creatures. They're, um, they're like a kind of a marine snail uh, scenario, but, but no shell, but all kinds of amazing additional add-on features like um, prongs that um, have toxins in them that can sting and kill other creatures and they're spectacularly coloured and beautiful. This is quite a humble, soft, rich brown kind of a beastie with lovely antlers, soft antlers. <laughs> Nudibranch. I ease my naked body down into the rock pool's closet clinging to the vertical rocks with my soles, hanging a moment before I let myself fall, slowly as a dim slip that shrugs off its hanger in a deep green changing room, air shouting silently from my struck lungs, I would try on the old clothes to see if they still fit. Dropping to the velveted floor, the seizing onesie of brillo hair, the sweat sheath that horripilates with urchinous buttons, each breaking wave dowsing me a costume, comfortably divested of my name. Perhaps still some permeable notion of self, arabesques of albumen, Prongs subliming to tender flame, condensing down to antlers, and weed, and warm, and warm, and weed. It's not at all warm in a Shetland drop room, I have to say. Um, 
But there's a funny thing that happens to you when you're swimming in a, in a cold sea or in very cold water where um, first it hurts like hell and your bones are on fire and then a kind of a, a the endorphins must kick, kick in, I guess. Um, it's kind of bliss washes over you and the cold feels warm suddenly. Um, I guess that's the, the first stages of hypothermia or something. It feels amazingly rapturous. You feel like you're dissolving into the sea. Um, but this is a craggier poem coming up, um, Limpet. Um, I've enjoyed reading this through lockdown. Um, I wrote it two or three years ago, um, before any of this happened. Um, but I've revisited it a lot recently because it seems to speak so much about home um, and what it means to be at home. Limpet. Stop now you're home and consider what that feels like. Don't stop. Continue to whirl an introvert tornado across the flooded rock pool in an ease of gypsy skirts, cyclonic, high and wet. This is not a thing to sit tight upon, locked your home scar against the migraine of the waves. This rebate will wait that you can spin home to like cup to saucer, matching every chip in your shell to its own rocky rostrum. Clamp down, turn the key of yourself in the lock of yourself, fasten with a hundred infinitism mortises. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of poems about rocks in this book and cliffs and sea arches and standing stones. And I'm just, I'm not going to read any of uh, the stone poems, um, which is a sequence of very different looking um, poems kind of laid out in a crazy typographical way that blood acts have been incredibly painstaking and patient with me. But, um, I, I will show you them on the page, but I'm not going to read them because the reason they're laid out like that on the pages I can't find the right voice to say them in. I'm trying to find a voice for stone and I feel like I can't speak quite slow enough for that. <laughs> so I had to do uh, this big font and grayscale and cram the pages full of them. Um, but I will read you a poem Dolman which is kind of the introductory poem and that is um, a human being addressing a standing stone and trying to engage it in conversation. And the stones do then answer the human, but, but on their own time scale, uh, geologically. <laughs> so this is that poem of introduction. Dolman. Standing stone, let's talk about you. Who knows how deep this grief goes down in your thick waist and whalebone skirt? Goodness knows how deep and wide, twinkling modestly with garnet, feldspar, whiffing faintly of bruised mushroom. Now we learn in school about deep time, six o'clock shadow, lichen, pouring down like porridge, lichen. But humankind a brief soft fireworks, prone to go off at a moment's notice. Are we even speaking the same language? Urgently, we hammer at your boarded up window, rattle and try your gritty grey door. And I'll maybe just show you a, a stone poem. Um, there's a nice double spread, so here's one. No, no, I don't know if, the, if you can pick that up okay. Let's go up for that name. Yeah. So I'm um, so grateful to Picador for their um, work with me on, on the layout here. That big, um, no, it's over this side, isn't it? Uh, that big dot there um, is a 90 point full stop. Um, I just needed to end the sentence with something that looked like a boulder. So <laughs> they are a bit mad. Um, but they were a hell of a fun to make. Um, I don't know how our 
Timeless Rosamond. Could I do one, one or two more, something like that? Okay. Um, but which? <laughs> um, okay, I'll read Strimmer. This is a a rare political poem, and it's it exists um, as a political poem um, to my surprise. I I tend to. Sp- and my poetic practice trying to avoid intention, um, trying not to decide what I'm going to do and how I'm going to do it, and rather let the language direct what a poem becomes. And what this poem began with was um, just an expression of how much I hate strimming, and it became quite a, an angry piece about certain political leaders. Um, and you can have a guess to yourself who they are, if you like. Or you can just think about mum, grass. It's up to you. Strimmer. Strimmer, you butcher. You a soul are the hardest to imagine. A poor soul, a kind soul, a good soul, easy. Soul, a deep ladle. Soul, a ladder. How intimately we tangle with our tools grafting them into our brains like prosthesis. I'm appalled by your skinny neck, thrusting the flat howl of your face into the meadow's tangle, screaming at stinging nettle, couch grass, clover, sending flying's little moth scrap souls. I can't find a thing to admire in you, thrash metal strap on, whose obsession with yield makes yielding impossible. Stumbling onward in evangelical fury, roaring your hateful rhetoric. All small voices drowned out in the carnage. The fresh green blood lying in your face. And I think I'll um, I'll finish up with something gentler. It's just a short poem um, about swans. Sound travels so far on the quiet evenings, especially in this. The human cough of sheep, the graveyard gate with its quiet hinge, and swans. On a still day, you hear the beat of their wings. Something like the creaking of oars. A longboat rowed from the sky's shore. The hoarse cry of the oarsman. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jen. That was just... (laughs) One of the things I always say in these is that I'm really sorry that we can't have a kind of round of applause because I know that people would be thrilled to clap for all of you and there's there's wonderful things about being able to do readings online and to get different voices in here but it's also a little bit lonely so please give yourselves a round of applause and um yeah thank you so much it's been really lovely to have you all here um so I'm gonna ask some questions and we could have just a little chat for a few minutes. And if anyone feels like you have questions for one another, please also feel free to jump in. So one of the things I was thinking about when I was reading your work was um, whether you feel that being rooted to a particular place is important or whether engaging with place and landscape kind of transcends the idea of belonging to one special home. I thought maybe we could start with Nidhi on that one. It's a very interesting question, Rosamond, for me, because I grew up in maybe 12 or 13 different countries, and so I don't have a sense of home being a particular place or, or even a particular culture. It's more of a it's more of a sense of, um, I think, home being a place where where I return to some 
some sort of presence that that draws me back in um and I think this is also why I turn to the natural world so much is because we are essentially made of earth and, and sky and stars, you know, and so you're always at home. It doesn't matter where you are on the planet. And I feel like, you know, my, my, my primary interface with the world is actually not through language. It's more through um feeling it's more through sensation and so it's interesting to try and then write about that you know to 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 try and transform it into language which is so static you know on on a page and and it was really interesting to see Jen the way that you know you have managed to try and approach that in in your own writing in terms of looking at at time and and how um, the specific our experiences are to, you know, being being bound, I think, by by the body and by time and by space, and that you'll have all these forces that are sort of interacting with that all the time, but that's not how other animate um, entities in creation might be experiencing that at the same time. So um, I'd have to say no for me, actually. I'd have to say it isn't, it isn't tied to to place in terms of geographical place, but but it is um, it is contained within that 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 body, you know. Mm -hmm. Jen, would you like to pick up on any of that? Yeah, that's that's a really beautiful way of putting it, Ruby. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think for me, it's home's massively important to me. I'm, I always want to be home, and for the last three or four years, I've been away an awful lot. Um, and with lockdown, I've been in Shetland for the. I've been living here for fifteen years, and lockdowns enabled me to be here for a full, uninterrupted year, and it's been absolutely amazing. I feel very calm, calm and rooted, and um, reluctant to go anywhere. <laughs> and, um, so I'm very much a homebody, but I think that. The image of the limpet's really useful to me because limpets um, have home scars. They have a, a circle on the rock that exactly fits the rim of their shell. Um, and when they go off grazing, you can see that on the rock. Sometimes it looks like a little bit of archaeology or something, these beautiful circles. Um, and they, they roam quite freely and they graze and they're quite um, aggressive towards other limpets sometimes. So, you know, they're quite dynamic. And then when the tide starts um, to go out, they kind of bustle back to the home scar and lock down into place. Um, and no one knows how they navigate. That's a very cool thing. So I feel, I feel a bit like that. Like I, I experience all these different places and, I draw a lot from them. They're very precious to me. Um, and I need them to stop me from getting too comfortable, but I always want to bustle back to my home scar. Um, poetry is a way of making a kind of limpet shell for yourself, I think. And when you're when you're away from home, you know, it's a way of making yourself feel at home by, I suppose, processing what you're experiencing. So, yeah, it's all about the limpets. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fantastic image, Jen. Would you like to say anything, Mark? I was really struck by how many different kind of places you were inhabiting in the poems you read. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I hadn't completely thought about that. Um, I, I think um, a little bit like like Nidhi, um, I, I moved to Ireland about about forty years ago. Um, so in a in a sense you know um this is not my my homeland you might say and um i'm aware of that uh but i i think um i think in my poems i'm i'm just um sort of trying not to stare too much out the window because there's there are swallows um nesting in the shed Right next to the window, and when they when they whiz past the window, uh, it's almost like they're they're flying through me. And um, 
I was just thinking that that in 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 some sort of way, I suppose in in my poems, uh, I have another poem that I wrote called "Open House," um, which is about the the sheer amount of other creatures there are in our house, um, starting from the the microscopic uh, and moving up to to bats and occasionally bees and and all sorts of things and um so i i kind of think of myself i suppose if, if this makes sense of um of being sort of rooted in that way that that i can allow things to to come through me and to to come to me and um to to look at them and and to celebrate them and to experience them so i think the idea of of having a a kind of homeland if you like is is not not terribly important to me um but the the idea of being open um to other forms of life it is something that that's actually very important to me I think that's a great answer. Um, and I'm really struck by you saying you're distracted by the swallows because I keep, um, I have a lot of starlings outside the window and they keep having fights and I keep looking over as we're talking. So it is really nice to feel like there's a whole landscape going on just within the confines of the house. Um, and I think something we've all been touching on as, or you've all been touching on as we've been talking is about um, kind of the vulnerability of the body and the the way the body um, kind of is open to the world around it. And I wondered if if you feel that kind of becoming open to nature and to being allowing yourself to be immersed in the landscape, does that also entail becoming aware of the fragility of the body itself? Um, Maybe Jen would like to jump in there. Yeah, I am a slow thinker. It's a really interesting oh, idea. No, it's fine. It's fine. Um, it's, it's put my mind in very interesting places, I think. Um, I feel... I think I feel less vulnerable, actually. Um, I, f I feel more vulnerable in a in a busy room full of people I would say. But um I I think I also feel more that it's it's me that's inflicting the potential harm. <laughs> I think Shetland's a um oh, it's, it's it's a fascinating place in terms of ecology and landscape. A lot of it's very fragile. Um there's a lot of quite degraded peat bog with beautiful mosses. Um that you can you can see your footprints on as you walk across it. You know your, your feet, your boots kind of stab quite deeply into it and leave these kind of welling wounds. And you always feel like you want you wish you could step a bit more lightly. Um, having said that, you can also find yourself on a cliff very suddenly. Um, and the cliffs in Shetland very often cut inland in a, in a kind of keyhole shape. It's called a gyo. Um You can find yourself stumbling at at the top of a cliff very, very easily here. Um, so you, you, you really could come a cropper. <laughs> I think that's what feels really precious about here is that um, that reality. There's no there's no danger keep out signs. There's 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 just the cliff um, and you've got to take care of yourself. Um, and there's winds that can knock you off your feet. And I don't know, it feels like a a, a mutual fragility if anything. Mm. I like that idea of mutual fragility very much. Yeah. I'm always struck by the kind of vulnerability in your work, Nidhi. I wondered if you wanted to maybe come in on that. I think I'm always very aware of mortality um, in my work and also in life. I think I don't I don't think it's possible to be truly you know, vibrantly alive without having an intimate relationship with death in that, 
you're curious about it, you know, you, you, you give it your attention, you find it interesting. Um, and in my, in my collection, so the first half of my collection is, um, follows sort of the, the arrows of, of the Hindu god Kama, who's known as the god of love and, and memory and desire in Hindu mythology. And the interesting thing about, and the thing that drew me actually to, to write about him was that in one of the best known legends from his life, he's sort of summoned to um, make Shiva, who's sort of the ascetic god, um, the supreme god in, in the Hindu pantheon, he's summoned to make him fall in love because there's a prophecy that the child that Shiva bears will be the god of war and will win the war for the gods. And so when Karma goes down to earth to shoot Shiva with one of his arrows, unfortunately things go awry and uh, the god of love is burned to ashes by um, this fire that shoots out of Shiva's third eye. And why he's there sort of in ashes on the ground um, and his wife is, you know, pleading with Shiva to resurrect him. Um, Shiva says he can't undo, you know, the curse that has been inflicted on him. But what he can do is he can transmute the essence of karma, so the essence of love, into everything around that is natural and beautiful. So, you know, when someone hears the songs of the birds or smells a beautiful fragrance from the flowers or you know, here's the humming of the bees or tastes some wonderful fruit that they will essentially fall in love, you know, with creation, with, with life, with all that, that that is. And I found that really interesting because it, it sort of asked the question, you know, what happens to the experience of love when it is untethered from the body, you know, what happens to that, that, that attachment when is freed from from the limitations of that encircling being and i think in in our relationship to nature which is you know um a little bit more muted a little bit less tangible it's interesting to ask the question because i think there is a way in there there is a way that you can fall in love with something that isn't embodied so yeah i think i think it's important to to look at it sort of from the angle of 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 the truth that everything is fragile, that, that it is transient, that it will disappear. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the use of talking about the God is so, is a wonderful metaphor and way into looking at the world like that. Um, Mark, I was very struck by your poem about the fall in which, a, like a huge amount of physical pain and, um, danger kind of brings you closer to the the world around you um so would that be something that had brought you kind of gave given you an, a different window into the landscape around you yeah i i think it did um you know i suppose it's not the not the ideal way to to find that out um but um the, the, the whole experience, uh, when I actually fell, um, I, I, I turned over very quickly twice in the air. And um, I was actually astonished at, at, at the speed. And um, I thought about this, this later. And um, I was thinking of it you know, in terms of, of gravity. And, you know, in terms of the fact that you, you don't really fall, but if there's nothing under your feet, gravity will pull you down. It, it's an actual force that is pulling you. And I, I think it's, you know, the only time in my life I've, I've ever been really aware, you know, felt that force directly. And um, it, it made me sort of aware of my body in that sense um there's a relative sense to it so, you know if i'd been on the moon for instance i i wouldn't have have gone down uh gravity wouldn't have, have pulled me down 
So it, it made me realize, you know, how provisional your sense of your your body actually is that you know things you might take for granted like how much it weighs or whatever they, these are entirely subject to all sorts of forces outside our control um so that that was yeah that that was very interesting to to experience that <laughs> I, I mean i hope i never have to do it again um but i i think it Another instance might be when when we went out to see the whales. Um, I was talking to somebody a while after it, and uh, they said, "Weren't you scared?" And uh, you know, it never occurred to me to to be scared. I mean, these are these are actually huge creatures, and I suppose if they bashed your boat, you know, you'd be over in a flash. But I I never. Um, never remotely felt scared and i i think that sense of 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 sort of losing your limits in that way of um not being aware of your limits of of sort of entering into um some other kind of relationship which takes you beyond the the actual limits of of your body uh, is a is a lovely thing um and i guess what one other thing you know there's a, a line in the poem about the odd uh vestigial bristle I, i'd read be, before i went that um whales used to live on land and then you know that so they would have been covered in fur and then millions of years ago they went back into the sea um but the, they they do still have kind of vestigial hair cells and i think for me suddenly seeing one of these you know i I felt an incredible kind of uh sense of togetherness with with this whales just through seeing that seeing that um hair on on the whale's skin um so yeah the the the, all sorts of ways i you know I, i think the body kind of expands um and opens up um when you're in the natural world or is is opened up mm. by being in the natural world yeah absolutely mm. i always think it's so interesting when we're with or i find when i'm with mammals even if it's a very kind of dangerous mammal i still feel a kind of closeness that we're all basically the same and the differences are well they can be a huge gulf between us at the same time there's this sort of a similarity there. Um, so I think we're kind of coming on to our time now, but if any of you have any questions for one another, please feel free to jump in. I think um, I think I have some animals that need to join in because I've been, like everyone else, I've been sitting here at a window a little bit distracted by birds happening outside. We've had a quite a strong southeasterly gale um, yesterday. And there's birds that are migrating across the North Sea at the moment, and a lot of them have been kind of swept up. So I've just, I've seen two things I've never seen before here. And oh, wow. the first, no, no, the second three Arctic terns have just flown overhead as well. So I'm just kind of, oh, very happy. <laughs> That's lovely. Great. Yeah, I've been seeing um, terns quite a lot too in the in Dunleary or in Dublin Bay. You can, I think they're, are they maybe roseate terns? And you you know they're black because you suddenly start seeing the splash and it's just, yeah. and you realise that it must be a tern. It's always a very, a great feeling of spring coming back. I think they're quite special, aren't they, roseate ones? I've never seen them. We don't get them, I don't think. Maybe like yeah. a rare one or two. That's cool. I, yeah, I suppose it depends on, I guess we're a bit less cold than you, so maybe they like it better in our waters. You can't blame them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, it was, it was so great to chat with all of you, and um, this was a really lovely morning. Um, so I'd just like to, yeah, just to say that I'm, I'm thrilled you could join us, and just thanks to everyone who's watching this event and who's been supporting these events that are, and we will 
have some more in the in the coming months. So please look out for more from Poetry at the Lexicon. And um, yeah, good night to everyone. And thanks again to Nidhi, Mark and Jen. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.